Well, in, in the homework three, I'm just tracking, you know, how much are you going to get done by next Thursday when I've now even set it back to be due. And, um, and I think the one that you're not going to get done, and hence I, I want to cancel that for this one, and I'll just put it in the next homework, is um, nine... is this case of scalar QED. In part C, at the moment you wouldn't know what sorry, what this thing is that you're being asked to compute. Okay? And uh, however, it's just another type of self-energy. It's just a self-energy for the proton. So I think you can do it. And it is defined in um, is the proton self-energy. usually called. So we will talk about it later, but uh, it's significant, but basically it's another self-energy type of problem, usually called vacuum polarization. And um, so I is that, and it corresponds to corresponds to this one particle irreducible where the electromagnetic field coming in has is, is this A mu and A nu. Okay, so one particle irreducible diagrams get multiplied by the fields. If the fields happen to have indices on them, then the one particle irreducible guy has indices on, and that's what this is. And you can see the, 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 the usual QED case uh, is in equation 7.71, and is ultimately evaluated so that you can, again, I don't want you to do the standard QED one, but you're asked to make a sort of numerical comparison, and so just do the case you're supposed to do, but um, it's evaluated. equation 7.90, okay, in terms of scalar so basically that
So you'll see, you'll see in the question 9.2c that they write pi mu nu is equal to eta mu nu q squared minus q mu q nu pi q squared. This is what I mean by the scale. The fact that you can write this tensor in this structure times a scalar um, this is the thing that for shorthand, so you don't have to remember all this, this is the thing that is evaluated in standard fermionic QED in equation 7.90. But what you're being asked to do is the scalar case, um, not the fermion case. But you can take a look at the fermion definition of pi and its evaluation. And you are supposed to do the scalar. Okay, but we still, even to do this, we have a little bit more to do. So let me see if I can do it today. Um, so there is a, uh, I, want, I want to write for one equation that summarizes everything I said last time, uh, which is we said we can calculate this renormalized. Um, calculate this by which I mean 5x1 and 5xn uh, for normalized and then this gamma n and this these basically the finite Green's functions are functions of m renormalized and lambda renormalized. Okay. And they're made finite by subtracting the local UV divergences, loop order by order. by choice of delta z, delta m, and delta lambda counter terms. So at every order in the loop expansion, I tweak these at that order. I modify that order I introduce something at that order. So that these things, when I calculate with them, subtract off whatever divergences were encountered at that new loop order. And these things are, are functions of mr squared and lambda r. So let me actually say that. By, by choice of as functions, That is the sense, that, that's why I'm not saying it's a function of this, this, and all of these. Because the job of these is to be the, is to attend on these parameters and to clean up the ultraviolet divergences that would normally come from this. At any order in perturbation theory, you've introduced these guys to make sure there are no ultraviolet divergences when you finally calculate it because you subtract all the ultraviolet divergences using this. At the next order of perturbation theory, even these guys will appear in loops. <clears throat> and then we'll introduce a modification of these guys at yet a higher order to cancel all the divergences that appear at any lower order. Okay. So this is the game that we're embarked on. Okay. And the idea is that, that this is the same as
so the statement that everything was passive, that the way I've said it here is choose these guys, which is already an action, a verb, choose, to subtract, which is a verb again. All of that is saying, however, look, no, actually, it's just, it's just the bare guy with a cutoff, which is very large compared to any experimental energy, compared to any of the length scales in X that you tend to probe, this lambda is incredibly ultraviolet. And so this looks like the old, good old cutoff, but unnormalized gamma. Nothing is being done. No verbs. It's just what you get from doing the, the, the path integral. And the statement that this is so so the statement that everything is passive is just that it's equal. It's equal to this guy. Okay. And 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 the the ma and, and so the, the magic is that I told you that this m zero, this lambda zero, and this delta and the z. Given, are given, as I gave last lecture, are given by mr squared lambda r and, uh, of course, the delta z and these delta m squares. So the statement of passive or active view of this is that if I think of if I think of m zero and lambda zero as my uh, and, and phi zero as my independent variables, I get a completely ultraviolet dependent mess which has to have a cutoff to even write it down. But if in fact, instead I switch to thinking of mr squared and lambda r as my independent variables, okay, where these guys depend on these guys exactly as in the formulas I gave you, right? They depend on these guys and the counter terms, but the counter terms themselves are chosen to keep subtracting off ultraviolet divergences. Then you end up with something finite in terms of these as the independent parameters. So where did the ultraviolet divergence go, we ask? Where did it disappear? And the answer is given by inverting. If you want, you say, look, I desperately want to see where my ultraviolet divergences went in this, in this way of writing things. Because I know they're there. I know you're cheating. Okay, so we can, so we can do that. We can invert this relationship so that we can say, oops, so we say this is, this is fine, right? But, but it does equal, um, sum over n, and lambda phi, phi, these phi's are final over
the end, the magic is simply this. First of all, this wave function of normalization place for holding quantity. Which these where, where and, and these z's so z z is also a function of uh, well it's a finite function of m r squared and lambda r, but if I if if I choose if I choose these as the independent variables, if I choose these as the independent variables, what I'm saying is that the mr squared is a divergent function of them. The renormalized coupling is a divergent function of them. But gamma r is a finite function of mr squared and lambda r. But thought of as a function of a function, gamma is divergent because it's a function, it's a finite function of m, mr, but mr is a divergent function. So everything is divergent. But the insight is that everything is divergent only through its dependence on this divergent quantity and this divergent quantity. So that if I go out and somehow fit this quantity and fit this quantity, I have a finite function of those fit values. And mathematically, this notion of fitting, you can see we don't have to go and fit it, we don't really have to do any experiments, we're just talking about the logical structure, is just to say, think of them as the independent variable. That's all it is. And that's what this way of doing it is talking about. It's saying, please choose, cho choose mr and lambda r as the independent variable. Choose these bare, these bare quantities, implicitly defined by these counter terms, so that everything is finite. And then you are going to get finite quantities. You're going to get finite gamma by choosing the counter terms in that way. Okay. But what I'd like you to sort of go through in your head is, is this statement here. I think this is the one which tells you what is the passive and brilliant insight of renormalization, that everything is divergent. Everything in sight is in some sense divergent in terms of the original things that you think of as your independent parameters. Yes, it's as bad as you think. But it is only dependent on all of these three quantities through these two quantities in a finite sort of dependence. Okay. So that's that's it. Now, I sloughed over, I have not sloughed over in what I wrote, but I sloughed over the words I uttered, the wave function aspect of this game and making it finite. Which is in some sense easier, because the divergences hidden that are being subtracted by this delta z. This is sort of completely, you know, the functions involved here could be very convoluted. This is just an overall multiplication by some z to some power. So it's in some sense a much easier thing. And what it says is if you work in terms of this finite, field, this renormalized field, rather than this field, then you absorb all the divergences basically by taking advantage of this delta z. And you know, when you're talking about the S matrix, the ultimate field renormalization, it doesn't matter whether you use this or this. Remember that the normalization of the field should be thought of as related to the normalization of the source, J. Okay? We've seen this once before when we were talking about self-energies and wave function normalization. If if I have a source which has some infinite amplitude to produce to, to produce this field, I can just rescale the strength of the source so it has a finite amplitude to produce this field. So there's a vaguely 
it vaguely looks like there are three quantities that you would normally talk about, the wave function and these parameters. The reason that the wave function ultimately is not thought of as an input parameter, you don't have to tell me what it is, is because when you calculate the S matrix, nothing depends on the strength of the source. Okay? The whole point of the S matrix is, please cut out all the things that depend on the efficiency of my detection or, produ or, or production mechanisms. So that only the intrinsic scattering amplitude gets included, and that's independent of the overall normalization of these, um, these quantities. Okay. But uh, talk it out to yourselves what's on the board here. You can talk, you can focus on any little bit of it. Oh, well, what's going on with these Z's, or what's going on with this? But, but this, this is it. There are two missing pieces in this whole story so far. Okay, there are two gaps that are glaring. So let me talk about the easier one first, and then we'll talk about the hard one. So gaps. In terms of what to do. Okay. Um, I said delta, delta quantities, namely delta z, delta m squared, delta lambda, were functions of m r squared lambda r chosen to subtract local divergences at every order. Now, if that was a unique characterization of these, then they would be a function. If I said, given these parameters as inputs, that at every order in perturbation theory, you get some local divergence and these are chosen to subtract that local divergence, and there's only one way to subtract the divergence, then these would be functions of this at every order in perturbation theory. And I could really say these are functions of this. The entire theory is specified by doing a path integral in terms of phi naught, m naught, lambda naught, which is given in terms of m r squared lambda r, and these three quantities, as I showed you last lecture. But since these themselves are functions of MR and lambda R, everything is a function only of two input parameters. <coughs> but it's not true that there's only one way to subtract a local divergence incurred by diagrams at lower orders. But there is an ambiguity in this subtraction. Uh, if delta z, delta lambda, and delta m squared subtract local divergences to some loop order, so do delta z prime uh, which is the old delta z plus any finite function of mr squared and lambda r, and etc. 
similarly Delta Lambda Phi. In other words, you're within your rights. If you already have a successful way of doing a subtraction of all ultraviolet divergences to some order, you can always keep the same counterterms, but with a finite local set of counterterms added to it. Yeah. Is that the same counterterm for each of the three? Or no. So, so let me say, let me say finite one, finite two, and finite three. Okay. As you can see, by subtracting a by subtracting something finite and local, it's still something that sits in a local counterterm, and it still accomplishes the task of keeping things finite. So there is an ambiguity. We, we hit this before. It's come up in some of the questions, even in the self-energy case. The decision, how much should you subtract? We know we have to subtract the ultraviolet divergences, but exactly how much finite stuff should you subtract? In some sense, you'd like to say, just why don't we have a simple rule? Don't, don't subtract any finite stuff. But sometimes the separation of finite and infinite is hairier than that. For example, you can sometimes have a Green's function that has some energy over the cutoff. And you say, OK, let's just subtract the cutoff dependent part. So I want to subtract, so I want to add. So, for example, if a gamma contains this, then we might think to take an S counter term, question mark, which is, which contains log lambda, so that we can knock off, so we can knock off that lambda and leave the log E. The log E is finite, the log lambda is divergent. Let's get rid of that. However, this is not dimensionally correct. You can't just take log of a dimensionful quantity. You have to make some decision. But so this is not dimensionally correct. So we must choose S counter term contains minus log lambda divided by, we usually call this something like mu, but basically some finite scale. Okay, to make even mathematical sense. That means that we have to have somewhere there, you choose some, you choose this mu to be one GV, I choose it to be two GV. We have to include some finite piece. Okay. So we're stuck with this ambiguity. And, and, and therefore, we don't actually have to. So these things, at the moment, we do not say that these things stipulate a function of these. So this happy little story so far has not yet come to pass. But, but what, why don't we just invent a random rule, an arbitrary rule which tells you how to pick the finite pieces. So any unambiguous rule to fix the finite <coughs> subtractions or counterterms as functions of the renormalized parameters. And I think we said something like that. I don't want to, I don't mind you. Any arbitrary rule 
uh, to do this is call a renormalization scheme. First of all, it works. That is, if you have some unambiguous rule, randomly chosen, which manages to stipulate some way of saying what the finite subtractions should be as a function of these guys, then you are in good shape because these counter terms now become true functions of this. So a renormalization scheme is a way of breaking this degeneracy in the choice of counter terms. And it's an arbitrary way of breaking it because once done, it um, certainly does render the Green's functions finite. And furthermore, you might say, but I feel like I'm doing something, I'm doing something random by choosing a renormalization scheme, and somebody else might choose a different renormalization scheme. But remember, all you're really doing is passively observing that the original bare action, while riddled with ultraviolet divergences, is secretly only dependent, on, is only strongly dependent on the ultraviolet scale, ultraviolet color, through a finite sort of, or through two, two dependencies on this. Any way you make that observation is, is good enough, okay? Because it tells you how many measurements to do to fix these highly sensitive quantities and then get on to calculating everything else. But in the end, all you're doing is calculating that bare effective action. We're calculating the bare effective action and noting that it has two sensitive, it has two directions in which it's sensitive to the ultraviolet and then everything else in every other way is insensitive. So any renormalization scheme or choice of breaking this ambiguity, so long as it does in fact subtract out the divergences, is, is okay. okay. So we'll talk about examples of such renormalization schemes in what's to come. But right now, th this was a logical flaw in what I said. But now, so, with such a scheme, truly have delta z, delta m squared, delta lambda as functions of m squared and lambda. So last class, when I rewrote the bare action in terms of a renormalized action and a counterterm action, it seems like I proliferated the number of inputs from two bare guys to five guys. But now these three are secretly functions of this by choice of some scheme. And so everything goes back to being a function of two input parameters. Life is good. And we can fit these two experiments because any experimental observable is a finite function of these two guys by the renormalization procedure. So that was uh, loophole number one. Uh, the second gap, okay, so this is one. So that first gap is solved by choice of renormalization scheme. The second guess scheme was, um, I said, I, I, I said, and I proved to one loop that UV divergences are local and therefore subtractable or renormalized away, subtractable by local <coughs> counter terms. Such as delta z d mu phi there's a local operator whose coefficient is delta z, or delta m squared, phi squared. There is a local operator multiplied by with a coefficient delta m squared, or delta lambda, phi to the fourth. There is another local operator multiplied by. Okay. But the hanging question was, there are many other local operators. 
why did I stop with just these three? Okay. But why not other local counter terms? So on. Okay. Why is it that I'm able to get away with only these three types of law? Being local is one thing, but these are local and there's only three of them. Whereas we know there are an infinite power of possible local operators you could have written down, each having their own coefficient. And why are why don't why do I not need them in order to render the effective action finite by the process of subtraction? Okay, so this is, the, this is the bigger of the loopholes that's hanging over us, and that's what I want to turn to now to sort of complete the theoretical overview of, uh, of what we need to do. So, it's often called power counting. Well, there are many things called power counting. Power counting UV divergences. The point is to try and understand, in quite some generality, what kind of ultraviolet divergences could you conceivably encounter. One thing we know, and it's an incredible insight, is that the divergences are local, but now we are asking, okay, they're local, but which local does? Okay. So if we look at a, a, a local a, lo, divergences in the effective action, if they're local, <coughs> that means they can be written as integral of some local Lagrangian, which I'll just call the divergence Lagrangian. So we are asking whether it is delta z, of course, we choose the delta z to subtract these things away. So And uh, so let's see who could be there. So, so could this L divergence, could it contain, well, what could it contain? What's the most general, again, you could easily, on the side, do the same thing if you had a theory with fermions and bosons and so on and so on. So we can clutter this up with many species, but let's just get the idea because it's more or less the same for everybody. Um, what? What is the most general structure of a local operator? Well, it's got some number of fields. And then it's got some number of derivatives. And I'm being schematic. And the derivatives can be interspersed among the fields. Okay, So it could be all of these n derivatives acting on one field. It could be each derivative here acting on a separate field, and so on. I mean, there, and, and this could be the new index or the new index. I mean, there are many possibilities. But just schematically, it looks like this. Okay. And and this thing, since it's in an action, it's in, in an action that sits in the path. It has units. In, the action has units of action, which for h bar equals one guys is dimensionless. Integral d4x of this is dimensionless, which is to say that this has dimension 4. Like any Lagrangian density, it has dimension 4. So we're doing dimensional analysis. And for dimensional analysis purposes, exactly which subscript I put on this derivative, or whether this derivative is acting on this all of the fields separately, or all of the same field, or something in between, doesn't matter. It matters that there are n derivatives, and every derivative has dimension 1. It matters that there are k phi's, 
and every phi has dimension one. Okay, I'm doing dimensional analysis, that's why I'm being this small. Okay. So to just indicate that I am being sloppy at that level. But this is dimension four, I know that. And this is dimension n plus k. Somehow they have to match up. But I know that this is also some sort of ultraviolet divergence. Otherwise, I wouldn't be worrying about it. I wouldn't be putting it in here. There should be some sort of ultraviolet divergent coefficient here. So there has to be some power of our ultraviolet cutoff. So let me call it S. Now you can see if naively you'd say, well, it should be some positive power. Blowing up like that. But but indeed it could be something like log lambda. So I have to allow this possibility. But it's not negative. It would be, it doesn't make sense to say that the coefficient of an ultraviolet divergence goes like one over lambda. Then it wouldn't be divergent. It would be insensitive. So so it has to be something like this. And then if you ask, well, what else could possibly, what else could possibly sit in here that could make up the dimensions that has any dimensionality? Well, masses, the masses of particles which could show up in this formula. And so let me put some masses here. But that's, and, and, and now, is T positive? It seems like by choosing negative powers of mass, I can make this anything, I can make anything happen. Uh, but in fact, it's not negative. saw polynomial in M at one loop. And we, we saw that, no, in fact, when I did the one loop proof, I pointed out to you that ultraviolet divergences are polynomial in momenta, which is to say local, when written in, in local derivatives space. But I also pointed out at the time, it didn't seem obvious where I was headed with that, that there were also polynomial with masses. You go back and look. So, so this is t greater than zero. So it's polynomial at one loop and, and in fact all loops. So this is now the full set of possible structures that has to come up and add up to four. Each of these things has dimension one. So this implies that n, by the way, if I'm polynomial in momentum, then I'm polynomial in derivative in x space, which means that this is greater than or equal to zero. Yes, we do know how to make sense of things like one over d squared, example of propagation, right, in but, but that's not what's happening. We're not getting non-analytic functions of p squared. We're getting polynomial in p squared. So hence, it is correct that this is there. And we're doing the endpoint or the k-point functions in gamma. I'm doing the, the one particle irreducible k-point function. So of course, the k is, <coughs> now you might say k could have been zero. Why not? Well, that is another famous problem that comes up in gravity, which is the cosmological constant problem. But we're not doing gravity. So it is pointless to talk about a zero point energy that could be sitting inside this ultraviolet divergence, because zero point energies we just throw away. Okay? So, so this is actually greater than. What we're being told, all of these positive points, so now we have some real tight game here. N plus K plus S plus T has to equal four. Another brilliant insight into the, which restricts the set of things. And you can see in one shot that that means that the set of possible divergent structures is finite. There are only finitely many choices of these integers that could ever satisfy this statement here, okay? So, only finite number of solutions. Okay, so 
you might have thought that just being polynomial, just being local, certainly stops us from having to think about the most arbitrary non-local functional, which is divergent. But it's still a big infinity of local operators. But now we see that the set of local divergences is in fact going to have to be, um, oh, sorry, is, 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 is going to be, fun well, sorry. Can I backtrack? Just, just a little bit. I can sense the hatred. Sorry, there's one other thing that could be dimensional. There's, there's, some, there's some order and perturbation theory we're working through. said was true. But in total generality, so, so, so let me just do the general case here. And I mean general case. Some could be dimensionful. Go check in relativistic units. What are the units for G Fermi? Okay, of weak interactions, fame. You'll find that it has negative mass dimension. Go check what units G Newton has in relativist in, in, in particle physics units. It also has negative mass dimension. So so this P, sorry, so this delta could be positive or negative or zero. We don't, we don't know yet, in total general. But, but we do have this sum rule, which is that delta p times delta, right? the dimension of lambda to the p is p times delta, plus k plus s plus t is equal to 4. This is n. Plus n. Now, we do see at a glance one thing, that if you don't restrict yourself to these negative, negative scale dimension coupling constants, then you would only have a finite number of divergences. Uh, a curiosity, but surely a simplifying curiosity, that we don't have to think of an arbitrarily large number of counter terms. And we'll see, we'll see what exactly is the pros and cons of such a situation. Um, we are still assuming a scalar field, but in a fermionic field, we have this. Yeah, so let me, let me do, um, you know what, let, 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 let's, let's do it all in one shot. Okay, so let's say field, field dimension. This D, think of any field that you know, bosons or fermions, that's it, that's all these two, um, is, is greater than zero.
P0? Not in four dimensional space time. Ah. So, so, let me put the word canonical. Just, just to, to, to be concrete. We are doing a, a lot of things where, um, so even, even a scalar field, um, we say just by dimensional analysis, is the action is dimensionless. This has to have dimension one. But um, if I have, so if I had a, so even here, let me consider a phi to the sixth interaction. Where this lambda, maybe I should call it something else, kappa, so this has d dimension minus two by dimensional analysis. Now, I could define this to look like this. Uh, and sometimes it's actually very useful, as I said, to isolate the coupling as being part of the H bar. Okay? So I could uh, so one over H bar kappa. How how can I get the kappa to sit here by doing a field redemption? Let's see. Um, Do this example because it's closer to the spirit of general relativity. This is a kind of weird derivative interaction. So, so here, if, if this term is going to work out, then five to the five prime to the fourth. Kappa squared like this. And this is phi to the fourth. So, so therefore, phi prime to the fourth, and then there's a kappa. Yes, a kappa phi to the fourth is equivalent to a phi prime to the fourth over kappa. So it works. This is so this is a true statement with this field redefinition. And this, this is nice because it tells you the kappa is like h bar, cool. But there's a price you pay. This phi prime, so phi prime is, uh, is dimensionless. Okay. Um, so even in the case of gravity, the metric field, the metric is of course dimensionless. But when you expand g mu nu as equal to the Minkowski metric plus h mu nu, so some fluctuation away of, of the metric, we often put m Planck here so that this is canonical. If you don't, it's like using the primed language. If you do, it's like using this language. And so for all our power counting, I, I've been doing canonical field theory normalization. But if you make this adjustment, everything will work. There it is. C 
secretly when you use any of these other normalizations where you're using a coupling constant to make your field dimensionless, then secretly in the same, it doesn't change the basic point. It just means that some powers of the coupling and some powers of the field are going together and you're calling it dimensionless by just taking into account that this is negative dimension, this is positive dimension. So it's just a different way of doing it. Um, but this is, this is our central result. What was this thing? I just want to make one digression. I forgot what it was. I cannot be helpful. Let me keep going. It's clear what we're supposed to do. So why don't we clean up our five and fourth case? the general situation for phi to the fourth field theory. Uh, this d is equal to 1. The scale dimension of a field is of a scalar field is 1, and the, the, the scale dimension of the coupling constant is 0. And so we find that n plus k plus s plus t is equal to 4. Only finite number of solutions which means only a finite number of possible Who are they? Let's go through. Now, 